Uh, this morning we want to talk about uh, maturity. The goal is to understand the nature of maturity, its characteristics, and the process of its cultivation. You know, in my experience, and I don't know if you've ever done this, but walk up to the typical parent, the typical pastor, and ask this question. What does it mean to be mature? And it's rare to get a well thought through answer to that question. I mean, we just often haven't given it the time to think it through. Which might be important if, particularly we're in some sort of ministry where our goal is to present all mature in Christ. Be that parent, teacher, pastor, small group leader, friend. So what do we mean by maturity? And again, part of it is maturity is really a, a global uh, concept. It has several different aspects. And we'll talk about all of those aspects or to some extent here. First, let's talk about what it's not. What it's not is the popularly sociologically constructed vision of what it means to be an adult. In other words, uh, we all are part of a tribe and that tribe tends to cast a vision. So if you're a 24-year-old male living in New York City, your vision of maturity might look something like Derek Jeter. Uh, if you're a 14-year-old uh, girl, your vision of maturity might look something like Taylor Swift. And the reason we would have these visions is because the tribe has elevated each of these persons, and we can think of hundreds of other examples, and said, this is someone who's got it. This is what you want to be like. And it's actually one of the more difficult things about the current cultural situation. They're real, most of the persons we lift up as, call them, you know, for lack of a better word, kind of goals for this is what you want to be like, really are quite dysfunctional, quite unhealthy. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the crisis among young men today. And uh, much of that you can attribute to the fact that if I'm 15, something inside me says, it's time to start to become a man. If I'm 15, I don't look to 45. I don't look around for a 45-year-old to show me how to be a man because that jump's just too big. I look to find a 25-year-old. Because, right, I'm 15, I'm not, it's going to be a long time until I'm 45. I need someone to show me the stepping stones to getting there. And look at the character of every 25-year-old that's put before our 15-year-olds. I mean, you, you, pretty much any television show, any movie, and often he's been our youth ministers. I mean, they're 25, but acting like 15-year-olds <coughs> to connect. And so then the 15-year-old has, oh, okay, that's what it means to be 25. And we have a crisis of man-boys. 
There's a very interesting article published uh, by, there's a journal published by the Manhattan Institute. And about uh, six years ago, uh, there was an article entitled, Man Boys in the Promised Land. And it was a sociological analysis comparing uh, 26 year olds in 1966 with 26 year olds in 2006. And the comparison was stark. In 1966, if you were 26, you were married and likely with one or two children or preparing for one or two children, to pre preparing to start your family. You uh, had a positive savings rate. In all likelihood, you owned your home for which you put 20% down cash, or you were living very frugally to save that 20% to buy your home. You worked 50 hours a week and the two weeks vacation you had were, I mean 50 days a week, 50 weeks a year and the two weeks vacation you had were spent with the in-laws so that they could see the grandchildren. I mean that was, and if you were a man, your mission was to take care of your family. It was not about you. Fast forward to 2006, same kinds of questions. If you're 26, you have a negative savings rate, despite if you, a large salary in which you're living by yourself or a smaller salary in which you're still living at home, even though you're paying for uh, extravagant vacations and you have every toy imaginable. There is no sense of preparing for marriage, preparing for, to care for others. Uh, it, the statistics were just striking. A lot of that, I think, has to do with the fact that culturally we don't have a clear vision of what it means to be a young man, and so we're not passing that along. And sadly, girls are starting to fall behind too. So by maturity, we've got to get beyond kind of the cultural icons, the cultural vision of maturity, and ask, what does maturity mean from a psychological, biological, and uh, theological perspective? So first, biologically. Remember, we are a body-soul-spirit unity. And maturity actually has something to do with ha what happens in our bodies and the way they're made and the way they develop. Uh, we'll look a little bit more at that shortly. Psychologically, as we develop physiologically or biologically, certain psychological capacities and expectations come into play. So what it means to be a mature four-year-old is quite different from what it means to be a mature 20-year-old. And then theologically, again we come back to that notion of a telos, that we are created with a destiny, that God has an intent for us, that He has a vision for the woman or man that we're created to be. So our idea of maturity is going to have something to do with our biology, something to do with optimal psychology, and something to do with our theological destiny. <coughs> All right, having said that with a background, let's uh, kind of step back and break it into some parts. Uh, first thing I want to talk about this morning is maturity as a set of habits. Maturity as a set of habits. Remember what a habit is. A habit is a pre-programmed brain response to a given situation or a given 
set of situations. So to be mature is to have the optimal kinds of response patterns, the optimal set of habits for a given age or life stage. Remember that uh, we always start to react about three-tenths of a, to a, a second uh, before we actually become conscious. So one of the things about a mature person is their initial reactions are in many ways optimal or we could talk theologically conform to the character of Christ. Another aspect we'll look at is that when they fail, they're able to recover. And that too is a set of habits that can be trained, or must be trained. We said yesterday, to the extent that our reactions are less than the character of Christ, uh, those brain habits are what Paul calls the flesh. All right. Maturity involves cultivating a certain set of habits. Now, interestingly, uh, those habits are to a large extent. Uh, well, l let's just let's just look at it this way. Would you would you take out the Would you look at the little picture of a human brain? Because maturity is a developmental process. An infant lacks the physiological capacity to, ex to execute adult maturity. Can't do it. Uh, I'm indebted to Jim Wilder. If you ever get a chance to hear him speak or to read any of his books, I'd highly recommend. He is uh, about the sharpest Christian psychologist I know. He spent a uh, lot of time studying the work of Alan Shore, who is the founder of a very interesting new field, and that field is interpersonal neurobiology. Uh, Dr. Shore is a research professor at UCLA. The basic tenets of interpersonal neurobiology is that brain development does not happen autonomously that our, all of our brains develop in relationship. And the kinds of relationships we have will determine the kind of brain we have. This is basically how our brain operates. Uh, level one. Notice in the center of the brain, uh, the thalamus. Now this, what I'm about to say is a vast oversimplification. I mean, the brain is the most complex thing in the galaxy, the human brain. So this is grossly simplified. But it points to the, the developmental nature of the brain. And, the, and to, it should give us some increased understanding of how these developmental processes are essential in the cultivating of maturity. Level one. The thalamus, or what Dr. Wilder calls the attachment light. That part of the brain seems to be, and again, we're kind of speaking metaphorically and in an overly simplified manner, uh, that part of the brain is fully functional when an infant is born. And the newborn infant's first question is this. To whom do I belong? First and most important question a newborn has. Again, it's pre-verbal, so. And, the, and this section, what we're calling the attachment light, seems to be the brain structure that engages that question. Think of the infant as having a flashlight, kind of neurologically grounded in the thalamus, and that flashlight is searching. Who, who do I belong to? 
Most important question for a newborn, to whom do I belong? Oh, mommy, you're to whom I belong. Now, if the baby looks around and can find no one, perhaps raised in an orphanage, in a third world country, with a hundred other babies, and is thrown a bottle a couple times a day and has their diaper changed once a day, but never touched, never held, as many as half of those babies will die for no other reason than that they didn't belong to anyone. Now, that, that tells us something very interesting about what it means to be human. That our deepest, deepest need is to belong. And then when we start to think about the scriptures, we say, well, God's whole purpose was to create a people who would belong to him and would belong to one another. I mean, think of the way uh, the beloved Apostle John, in writing to the church towards the end of his life, I mean, how does it begin? Everything that I've seen, heard, and handled, and touched concerning the word of life. In other words, everything I know about Jesus, both in my years with him, physically, and in the years in which I've walked with him since, everything I know about him, I proclaim to you. Why? So that you can have koinonia with each other. And our koinonia is with the Father and with his Son. And I write all of this so that our joy might be complete. In other words, the whole, as John understands it, the whole mission, the whole purpose of this Jesus thing is that we would belong to one another and belong to the Father. I mean, belonging is the deepest need. Now, this has huge impacts for families, for schools. I mean, any child show up in a classroom and not belong, really nothing else is going to matter so much. A child be part of a family and not feel they belong, nothing else is going to matter so much. The attachment light it answers the question, to whom do I belong? And it initiates the emotional experience of joy when we perceive that someone else is glad to be with us. In other words, if the first question for a child is, whom do I belong? Joy becomes the preeminent emotional response that, that the child is seeking. And joy is not happiness. Joy is, it's good to be me here with you. That's a very important distinction. Joy and happiness. Happiness is, I'm delighted in what's happening. Joy is, I'm delighted to be together even if we have to go through this. Uh, I remember about 10 years ago, uh, a dear friend of mine was dying of brain cancer. And so I, I had a trip to DC and took some time off to go over to the hospital to spend several hours with him. Now, we both knew that, apart from a miracle, this would be the last time we would ever be together, this side of glory. So we sat and chatted and laughed and cried. And, and it was a totally joyful time. Very, very sad. Very sad. I mean, he's about to die. and. Uh, leave a widow and three children under six. So it's very sad. But I wouldn't have wanted to be anywhere else. You know, I, it was good to be me here with, there with him. Joy is not happiness. 
In fact, the only joy worth having, worth, worth having can function in the absence of happiness. Joy is, it's good for us to be together. We belong to each other. Come what may, it's good to be together. And that's actually the kind of koinonia that John's talking about when he opens his epistle. We belong together. That kind of experience of joy and belonging is critical to establishing a sound psychological foundation. Persons who grow up without that kind of foundation, who belong to no one, who have minimal joy experiences, don't know what it's like to be good, to be good together, uh, life becomes very, very difficult. And life is very, very painful. And Christ can bring healing and does bring healing. But it is a long, painful journey. Level one, the attachment light. Level two, the critical structure here is, see the little uh, structure called the amygdala. The amygdala's, you call it the stoplight. If the level one, the thalamus is the attachment light or belonging, level two is the stoplight. And uh, it answers the question, is this good, bad, or scary? Good, bad, or scary? And if it gets bad or scary, it initiates the fight, flight, freeze responses. If something's overwhelmingly scary, it can initiate disassociation so that really the psyche fragments and disconnects with reality. Uh, you know, I've, I've had the privilege of working with some persons who have uh, what we used to call multiple personality disorder or dissociative identity <coughs> disorder. And uh, those are cases where uh, some, th some things that are very, 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 very bad have happened. And so to protect the self, uh, fighting fleeing or freezing are not good enough just because it's too bad, too scary. And so they have to kind of disassociate. That's not, what's happening now is not really happening to me. And so they create an alternate personality uh, to take the pain so that they can psychologically survive. Uh, so the stoplight, uh, level two, you can imagine what can happen if the one to whom I belong is scary or bad. The kind of memories that then get encoded in the brain and the relational dynamics that get established. Or if the one who is, to whom I belong is rarely there. Uh, it's really one of the reasons that institutional daycare uh, is a public health nightmare. Every teacher knows the difference between a child who was brought up in institutional as opposed to family-like. Mom and, mom and dad are always the best. Grandma, aunt, uncle are second best. The reason, because grandma, aunt, and uncle will still be there later. Uh, Next is family-like situations, so that so, so that you know you've got someone who's got four or five children and can be mother-like, you know, who can actually bond. But put twenty children, put twenty-three-year-olds in a room with one adult and two teenagers, or two twenty-year-olds, and there's 
and no one belongs to anybody in that room, that has very adverse developmental effects. I mean, the data is all in. We just, for sociological reasons and political reasons, choose to ignore it. Uh, and every teacher knows the difference bet when they come between the five-year-old who had a bonded relationship with mom and dad, albeit imperfect, because there are no perfect parents, but at least the child knows to whom they belong and the person to whom they belong is primarily good. You know, might have their moments of getting bad or scary, but for the most part, great majority of the time, the one to whom they belong is good. That child, as they develop, develops a very different psychological framework because they develop a very different neurological framework than the child who much of the time doesn't belong to anyone. And then I'm in a situation where I've got other three-year-olds who can get bad or scary and there's not an adult there to help me process it and there's, you know, or we just put in front of screens. Uh, I mean, every kindergarten teacher knows the difference between children who have who come from a context where they belonged and the person to whom they belonged and were with was good, and someone who spent much of the time not belonging to anyone. Children, uh, one of the most important things for parents to ask themselves is, do children need parents like a flower, like a tomato plant needs a gardener? You know, a gardener, a tomato plant needs a gardener, pull out weeds, put up a fence to protect the, from the deer that'll come eat the tomato plant, uh, water, make sure it's watered, make sure it's fertilized. That's what a gardener does, right? Might take a few minutes every day. A faithful giving fertilizer, water, protection. Or do children need a parent like a tomato plant needs the sun, right? tomato plant who's got the sun four hours a day just is not going to flourish like a tomato plant that's got the sun 12 hours a day. Just no way. <coughs> like we, we do understand there are various life situations. To be a single parent is particularly difficult. But to whatever extent possible, children at least need a family-like situation preferably with actual biological family because biological family will be around years from now. The reason a something else is second to that is because if I'm two and I belong to you and you're good and I belong to you much of the time for the next 10 months but then I lose you after 10 months then I start to expect that I will lose the ones to whom I belong. So that too is not, sometimes it's the best case possible, but that too is not optimal. Anyway, this is, if you want to read a, a challenging book on it, uh, there's Why Love Matters by Sue Gerhardt. She is a protege of Alan Shore, and uh, she writes specifically on, this, on, the, on the needs of young children developmentally. Why Love Matters by Sue Gerhardt. So there's five, four, well, this, in many ways, we've got four levels here. There's a fifth level we'll talk about, too. Uh, The interesting thing is when a child is born, levels one and two are fully op operating. And as when a child's born, their attachment light is looking for someone to whom they could belong, someone to joy bond with, and their stop-go light is fully working. In other words, they assess good, bad, scary. Interestingly, the third level, uh, and you can see it's the, 
uh, cingulate gyrus, usually the right cingulate gyrus, is very undeveloped when a child's born. In fact, the whole human brain at birth is the least developed part of the body. I mean, the little heart will grow in size, but it's fundamentally going to stay the same. The brain's structural architecture is yet to be determined in many ways. Now, obviously, the, the primary structural fields are there, but the exact wiring of it happens as we grow. Level three, the joy center of the brain, or the right cingulate gyrus. It answers the question, is it good to be me here? Is it good to be me here with you? So this is the way it goes. I'm born into the world. My attachment light scans to find out who I belong, I find mom, I find dad. Oh, I belong to you. You're good and not bad and scary. Great. Now you're the one to teach me how to do joy. How to live a joy-filled, fully relational, fully human life. I've found you and we're together. The uh, I mean, some of you have heard me talk about the joy game that parents play with newborns, right? The, you hold the little baby, you look down, mom smiles, baby smiles, mom smiles a little bit more, baby smiles, mom smiles a little bit more, baby smiles, big smile and goes wee and looks away. And the good enough mother looks away too because what the baby is saying, that was wonderful, but that's all the joy I can handle, so we need to take a break. So they take a break for a second, then they play it again. Now that's actually, that, that is a very important game. That's actually building the right cingulate gyrus or the joy center of the brain in a very healthy way. The child is experiencing, remember, the brain develops based on its experiences. A baby who doesn't have that, doesn't learn how to process joy, doesn't expect joy, doesn't expect relationship, or expects relationship to be scary, and doesn't know how to handle life. Interestingly, there's a direct correlation between joy capacity and the ability to process the six painful emotions like fear, anxiety, shame. Uh, the, the bigger my joy cup, the more capable my right cingulate gyrus, the better I can handle all those emotions. Interesting. Because they're processed in the same part of the brain, principally. This is the, so the, the level three, the cingulate gyrus processes not only joy, but peace, fear, anger, shame, sadness, disgust, and despair. If you're human, doesn't matter what culture you grew up in, you know the emotion, you have the emotions of peace, fear, anger, shame, sadness, disgust, and despair. They are part of what it means to be human. And it doesn't matter what culture you, you come from, those emotions are communicated through the same sort of facial micro-expressions. And persons from different cultures can read one another in terms of those expressions. Isn't it interesting that the more joy peace, the stronger your joy cup, the better you can process those feelings and not go into major brain dysfunction. And the joy capacity is directly linked to the quality of relationships in these early developmental stages. Now the good news is, if I didn't get such 
a strong joy cup or a big joy cup. I can still learn. I can still build it. Because the brain is plastic, the brain changes. But we'll talk about this more later. For that to happen, I'll have to be in relationship with some high joy, very skilled people who can manage not only their own emotions, but can manage my emotions too and stay in joy. If unable to process painful emotions, or a particular type of painful emotion. Now, let me say this. Uh, first, joy, peace are cousins. I mean, it's not an accident that the first fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace. Uh, love is an intention to give myself for you, that I am committed to your well-being. I mean, biblically, agape means I am committed to your well-being regardless of the personal cost. When Jesus, when the scriptures say Jesus loved us and gave his life for us, it's he was committed to our well-being despite personal cost. Now, actually, to love well, you have to do joy and peace pretty well, very well, too. You, you, you can really only love as well as you can do joy and peace. Uh, because joy and peace are cousins. Uh, joy is, it's good to be me here with you at a high energy state. Wow, it is really good to be together. Peace is, it's good to be me here with you at a low energy state. And that's why in the joy game with the baby, you alternate between joy and peace. Joy and peace. You know, the high energy joy, big smiles, peace. Everybody's heart rate, blood pressure goes down. It's just good to be held, good to hold, good to be together. Joy, peace. The higher our baseline joy, peace levels, the greater our capacity to handle uh, fear, anger, shame, sadness, disgust, and despair. And actually, largely based on the skills of those with whom we grew up. You know, there's those to whom we belong and those who taught us how to handle these various emotions. We will have greater or lesser capacity in each of the, to handle each of the painful emotions. Notice I say painful. I didn't say bad. These are painful emotions. But, like sadness, it's very good that I could feel sad with my friend who's dying of brain cancer. Something would have been wrong if I couldn't feel sadness. There are times when it's very good to be angry. That's what strong protectors do. What they don't do is get angry out of self-interest. Or because self feels insecure, and so now I'm going to get strong by being angry. No, but uh, if you pull up to the school and you have invited all of the fourth grade girls except one to go with you to some party you're having and you leave one fourth grade girl by herself on the sidewalk in tears because you've taken everybody else and you're supposed to be the adult, I will be angry. And I will be angry because that's the strong protector in me wanting doing what I'm supposed to do, which is protect the little girls of my community. Right? See, that's, there is a time for anger. Now, by God's grace, it would be controlled and directed. And I, but you would know I was not happy about this.
And again, that's, so these are not bad. The problem is if they're, we have not learned to experience them in a mature way. For instance, of those six, uh, I do sadness very well. Like people would come into my office, I can weep with them, I can, I mean, I, I do sadness really well. I can go with, I mean, it's, I can be sad if you're sad. I can, and, and I don't need to relationally disconnect with you because you're sad. I can stay there right with you. Uh, I, can, I can do anger pretty well. I mean, you can come to me and you can like be losing it. And, and I can, you know, I, I understand. You know, that's, yeah, that was hard. Yeah, I, I, you know, you, I can see you're very angry. Yeah, I, I get it. I, I totally get, you know, I can, in most cases, do anger pretty well. Uh, the one that I'm, I've had the most struggle with in my life is shame. Like, I, I find shame hard to deal with. I'm much, much better. I mean, it's a strange thing. Uh, for instance, you know, if uh, we were standing in the lobby and uh, I overheard two of you talking and, and you said, one of you said to the other, uh, gee, uh, Bill looks like he's put on some weight. You know, I might, you know, that would like ping me a little bit. And I, I'd say, well, gosh, did I, you know, what's, <laughs> Did I, you know, half I or, you know, do I, yeah, it would ping me a little bit. Uh, but if I heard two of you talking and you said, you know, that Bill St. Cyr, he's, he's really stupid. You know, my, my reaction to that would be, isn't that interesting? I, I wonder what's going on with them. Uh, well, you have to say calling someone stupid is actually a bigger insult than... <coughs> saying that, suggesting the possibility that he's gained some weight. So why is it that one pings me and the other doesn't? Well, it's, it's really quite simple. And that is, actually no one ever accused me of being stupid growing up. So, let, there's, so, in, so there's just no neural network that's going to resonate with that. I mean, there is no engram or set of neurons that are going to get pinged that's going to go to pain centers and cause you know me some emotional distress that I have to that because that was never my experience I'm just not set up to have I mean neurologically it's not that I'm more virtuous I, I, I'm not neurologically set up to experience pain at that com kind of a comment on the other hand, uh, between 6th grade and 8th grade, I went from 5'5", 160 pounds, to 6'1", 160 pounds. So, and, and that was between the end of the 7th grade and the 9th grade. So, in 6th and 7th grade, I was a pretty big boy. And, I mean, friends would, um, you know, do it, not what, the, they, do, what they ought not do, uh, or less than their best, being less than their best self. Certain friends would say, you know, Big Bill, uh, Slim, these are some of the things that friends call. So, you could see how there would be a, like a neural network there, just waiting to be pinged. While there'd be no neural network waiting to be pinged in the other situation. So for the, part of the moral of this story is that most of our, our emotional responses, I shouldn't even say most, all our emotional responses have a history. I mean, they, we respond as our brain has been wired to respond. And again, that's why the development of this joy center in bonded, healthy, high joy relationships is so important. Because if I grew up in a high anxiety, low joy state, then I am wired for high anxiety. 
and I am not all that wired for relational joy. The reason, one of the reasons we're talking about this is, well, a couple of reasons. One, maturity is going to require some brain transformation. And it's going to require developing some skills that might not have happened at the appropriate time. So if I did not grow up with a lot of high joy bonded relationships with people to whom I belonged, and if I didn't grow up with people that do the six painful emotions well, how am I going to do it well? Well, I'm going to have to learn now from someone who does them well. Now, you can even go back to my shame issue. One of the reasons I, is my dad didn't do shame well. My dad's the son of an alcoholic uh, who never heard his father say a positive word about him. Now, my, my grandfather would say all kinds of positive things about my father when my father wasn't in the room. But if he was there, he never heard it. So there was a shame, I mean, he didn't, there's a shame component that he didn't learn well, so he wasn't able to pass that skill on to me particularly well. Now he's come tremendous ways. I mean, he's a remarkably godly man at this point. But it's taken him 75 years. On the other hand, for instance, my mother does sadness really well. Like if you're one of her children and you're sad, she will totally connect with you, stay in the sadness with you, and you'll learn how to process sadness. I mean, it's an interesting thought to, to ask yourself, uh, of the six painful emotions, <coughs> and they're fear, anger, sadness, disgust, and despair, which do you do well and which not so much? I mean, if, if something scares you, are you likely to go into cup overflow? Are you able to be sad with someone? Or, or as soon as sadness enters the room, you check out. Your relational circuits go up. And so, I mean, again, back to the relational circuits. Can I keep my relational circuits turned on in each of these six emotional states? That's really a good measure of your capacity and maturity in processing each of these emotions. Uh, another thing that we learn is how to recover from these painful emotions and to stay in relationship in the midst of them. I mean, if a child is experiencing fear and there's no, they, well, first, they don't know how to get out of it. Like, I'm 18 months and something scared me. My brain's now going in this fear loop. And I don't know how to get out of it. And I need mom or dad to attune with me and instruct and basically model how to get out of this fear loop. But if I'm left, and again, this is one of the great problems of a child being in a context where they're with no one to whom they belong whether it's for throughout the day when little scary events would happen because you've got all these other three-year-olds. There has to be an adult that will notice I'm in a fear state, attune with me, have their relational circuits on with me, and help me to process that fear to move beyond it. Now, if someone does that for me, then I learn fear is not a black hole. Fear is something you experience and you move through and get out of. But if nobody's ever there to do that for me, then I begin to, then what I learn is fear is a neurological black hole. And so anytime something scares me, all the relational circuits are going off 
and I am going into fight, flight, freeze mode. Because who wants to be in a, in a dark black hole? Same thing for each of the painful emotions. So it's worth asking myself, which of the painful emotions do I do? Well, which of the painful emotions do my children, my students do well? Uh, how do I connect with them when in the presence of their painful emotions? Can you list those seven again? Uh, the, well, the six painful ones. Yeah, well, there's joy, peace. So those, those are not painful emotions. Uh, although for some people, I should say, being connected to someone is painful. Because if I grew up, when I was little, the one to whom I belonged was painful. Then anytime I go to connect with someone, connections are painful. But by and large, I mean, for the vast majority of us, uh, joy and peace are the high relationally connected feeling. And then the six are uh, fear, anger, shame, sadness, disgust, and despair. So it's a good question. How well do I do joy? When I go low joy, how quickly can I get back to joy? How well do I do peace? When I lose peace, become anxious, how quickly can I get back to peace? Fear, when I experience fear, how quickly can I move through it? Same thing for anger, shame, sadness, disgust, and despair. Level four, the orbital prefrontal cortex, or what Dr. Wilder calls our true heart. This answers the question, what is it like to be me? Uh, this is the part of the brain that maintains uh, our autobiography and our sense of self over time. Damage the orbital prefrontal cortex and I will lose all sense of who I am. I will lose all the connectedness of the memories that give me a sense of what it means to be Bill. Now again, the interesting thing is that as we grow up, that sense of self is relationally constructed. I discover who I am through you. Through you. I see myself through your eyes. I learn to value certain events based on you're valuing them. I learned to value certain things about me based on your valuing them. I can learn to despise certain things about me based on your despising them. Our true heart, it also maintains the road map of our best responses. So it's the sense of, I know, I mean, all of us have had the experience of acting in a way in which afterwards we say, that's just not me, right? I mean, we've all had that experience. We all probably have that experience regularly. That's just not me. And in a sense, that's an accurate assessment. Uh, but when I, say, when I say that, what I'm saying is there are certain response patterns in my brain that do not correspond to the sense of my best and truest self, which I have constructed as a, mem in a, as a certain image in my prefrontal, in my right prefrontal cortex. In other words, so obviously there's some me and then there's other brain functioning. That sense of who I am and what it means to be my best self is uh, level four. Our, what Wilder calls our true self. Interestingly, uh, Jim, main, Jim Wilder maintains that this is the neurological center of our spiritual life. Because it, it is the part of the brain in which we are conscious of who I am 
conscious of who you are, conscious of what our relationship is like, conscious of what I would like our relationship to be. And the same thing holds true for my sense of God. It's the part of the brain that manages my sense of who God is, who I, I mean, not, not the theological doctrines, which that's level five, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, my, the actual image and expectations I have of God. I mean, you, you can theologically affirm uh, that God is good, but at the same time, really expect Him not to treat you very well. I mean, I've had plenty of people, I've known plenty of people who, that, that really is the case. I mean, they, their expectation is God won't treat them well, but theologically they know He's good. Uh, that's actually a fight between uh, level five or their left prefrontal cortex and level four or their right prefrontal cortex. Uh, it's where our mental models are stored. We talked briefly about mental models yesterday. We can have, we can have a positive mental model of who we are. I'm the beloved son, the beloved daughter. Uh, or we can have a more destructive, less helpful mental model. So mental models are constructed and destroyed in that part of the brain. Level five, uh, the verbal logical explainer. It answers the question, how do I explain this? Now notice the difference between the questions asked by level four and level five. Level four is, what is it like to be me? So in many sense, level four's goal is holistic understanding. Level five's goal is, how do I explain it? It's the logical, analytical, linguistic part of the brain. It helps us make sense out of experiences in terms of explaining them. Oh, this is why I react this way. Doesn't necessarily change the reaction in any way, shape, or form. Uh, it interprets ex the experience of developing beliefs. In a more common vocabulary, metaphorical vocabulary, we would say the left prefrontal cortex is the head, the right prefrontal cortex the heart. Of course, both are grounded in the brain. Now the role of the verbal logical explainer when properly used is to critique our heart and guide us to finding our true heart. Uh, here's the really interesting thing, and also why uh, certain kinds of discipleship have not been effective. Why discipleship based on simply the transfer of information and then the trusting in good decisions have not been effective. Because we actually live from the lower levels up. And so, if level one's not functioning well, if we don't have a sense of belonging and therefore a sense of being a whole self, nothing else above it works really well. If our stoplight, if it's constantly going haywire and always assessing fear, danger, danger, fear, fear, run, you know, then that's going to override everything else. I mean, you've probably seen it in a child's eyes or an adult's eyes when level two is just saying, screaming, danger. And you j there's just no talking to them. I mean, you, you, I mean they just want to run away, fight, or freeze. Sitting down and having a rational discussion just isn't happening. 
And the reason is because neurologically, those parts of the brain aren't open. <coughs> Here's you know, one of the more fascinating brain scans that I've seen. Uh, it's the brain scan of someone who's level three, their joy center, the banana in their brain, is glowing bright red, which means one of the, it's experiencing one of the painful emotions beyond the level it can handle well. So it is totally stressed out. So imagine a picture of, the, of level three in distress. The really interesting thing is what happens to the frontal lobes. They're totally black. I mean, which, it's the brain scan of someone who's had a frontal lobotomy. So actually, when level of distress from one of the six painful mo emotions starts to significantly exceed our joy capacity, the frontal lobes of the brain are shut off. Which means I lose my sense of who I am, I lose my ability to connect to other people, I lose my ability to logically interpret and understand. And when that happens, I then just kick back to all the only resources I have, which are fight, flight, freeze. And uh, as a teacher, I mean, you, you periodically see children in frontal lobe shutdown. I mean, they get in distress or they're headed to distress. And the only thing you can do is get them to a safe, a place where they feel safe and where they can calm down. Sometimes we go into that kind of shutdown. And the only, people, the only thing anyone around us can do is help us to get to a place where we can calm and our frontal lobes can turn back on. Uh, well, why spend so much time on this? I mean, why, why this understanding of the brain? and How is it helpful for maturity? Again, it, one thing it does, it says we are fleshly beings. So just because I, ha, you know, I, ha, if I, I don't manage fear well or I don't manage anger well, it's easy for those to trigger me and overrun my right singular gyrus so that I kick, am kicked back into fight, flight, freeze mode. If that's what's happening, one more Bible verse and just telling me to be anxious for nothing or not to let the sun go down on my anger, uh, that alone is really not going to be very helpful. That alone is just not going to do the job. Now, if I happen to have those capacities and I am indulging anger, then you tell me that and, okay, yes, you're right, I might. But if I really don't have the skill set to process these emotions well, just placing a bit of more information in my verbal logical explainer isn't going to help very much. The other thing that's interesting to note is that when I get in a high level of distress, my uh, right cingulate uh, gyrus is glowing red. As that distress goes up, the quality of the functioning of my frontal lobes goes down. And as that goes down, I lose my sense of who I really am. And I lose my sense of who you are. And all the time, and then I will engage the verbological explainer, but with one mission. 
to justify why I'm feeling the way I'm feeling. And generally to explain why you're bad and responsible for it. Now that's not to say there might not be some truth in the fact that what you did was wrong. But really, my verbal logical explainer, when, under, when the system's under distress, and this is something for us to own, when the system is under distress, my verbal logical explainer is not interested in the truth. It's just not. What it's interested in doing is explaining to me why I am in this situation and why you should do something to make it go away or it's your fault or, or it's my fault or I mean depending on our orientation some of us when we get into stress what our verbal logical explainer does is starts to kick in and says well of course you are because this you're so bad because you're like this you know others of us when our verbal logical explainer kicks in it wants to tell me why you're so bad uh, but it's not interested in the truth. It's really not. It's only interested in one thing, making the stre distressing events go away. And since, it, since the verbal logical explainer really doesn't know how to do that, it kind of panics. In other words, you cannot think your way out of emotional distress. Can't do it. We can't, we cannot think ourselves to peace. Now what we can do is we can be aware of what's happening and we can remember, you know, the kinds of things that I need to do to move me towards peace. Like, I can remember I'm in distress. Uh, beating up on my child right now isn't going to help that. I need to walk away. Now that's absolutely a, a, a helpful thing to remember. And then when I walk away, I can remember, okay, I am in distress. I need to redirect my focus to things I'm grateful for. Or I need to find Jesus and engage in a conversation with him. Or I need to find someone to connect with so that I can let go of this. So, so my right cingulate gyrus can calm down. So the verbal logical explainer can be helpful, but you can't think your way out of emotional distress. It's very, two very different, what's, what's happening is going on in different parts of the brain and actually neurologically the verbal logical explainer is a million miles away from the right cingulate gyrus. So it just doesn't. So what it does is it, it just notices that everybody, that the whole system's in distress so it wants to explain it because it's doing its explaining thing. That's what it is, the verbal logical explainer. As a person develops physically, and think child growing up, she encounters many physical skills that she must master in order to thrive physically. For example, she must learn to coordinate her feet and legs and trunk and the complex skills of walking and running. She must learn to coordinate the movements of her fingers and thumbs and many complex skills of manipulating objects with her hands. She's got to learn to coordinate her movements of teeth and tongue to speak. There are physical skills that you learn during the process of physical development. Skills that you learn as you grow in physical maturity. And remember, these are very, very complex skills. I mean, often we forget how complex it is to, to, to walk or to write. And to master these skills actually requires developing certain habits of the brain. Right? To stand here 
balanced is not difficult because I have that, the necessary neurological structures to maintain balance. At 10 months, I didn't have those. And it's a highly complex task to master. But all these are skills we've got to master in terms of physical development. Similarly, as a person develops psychologically and spiritually, she encounters many psychological, spiritual skills that she must master in order to thrive. For example, she must learn to handle the painful emotions. I mean, here's the thing. No one's born knowing how to handle the six painful emotions. Now, it is true, like in all physical skills, some are more natural than others. Let's think throwing a baseball. I mean, there are a few. They pick it up, and it, you know, it's pretty straight from the first throw. Some, first time they pick it up, it falls behind them. You know, but the vast majority of children, vast majority, with some time, some high joy, relational connectedness around throwing a baseball, and time and practice, they can develop the necessary neurological, <laughs> physiological habits to throw a baseball. Vast majority can. See, the same thing applies to psychological skills, like returning to joy like handling the various painful emotions. None of our children are born knowing how to do that. We weren't born knowing how to do that. We've got to learn how to stay with painful emotions rather than to freeze or fight or flee, to think and behave appropriately while feeling these emotions. It's a good question. Can you stay your best self when experiencing the painful emotions? And how intense can you take it and still say, stay your best self? And for various painful emotions, it'll be at various levels. But again, it's important. that's a skill that we can cultivate. And as soon as we own that, it can really change our relationships. Because what we tend to do is whatever level of the painful emotion we can take comfortably, as soon as it gets beyond that, we find somebody to make bad. Because if you just, because I am now beyond what I can handle, and if if you did it right, and maybe the someone's me, or if I did it right, then we'd still have a level of painful emotion that I could handle well. But since we're beyond that, somebody's bad. Maybe it's God that's bad. When we've got to reframe that and just be curious, well, what would it be like to be me to be able to take this kind of painful emotion and still stay my best self? I mean, wouldn't that be a better solution? And it's not commenting one way or the other whether what the person is doing is right or wrong. They're, I mean, they probably are doing something wrong. But if I could stay my best self, I might actually be able to help that problem. If I can't stay my best self and I just have to make somebody bad, I'm probably not a whole lot of help to the situation. As a person develops psychologically, spiritually, she encounters many psychological, spiritual skills that she must master in order to thrive. She must learn to handle the painful emotions, to stay with painful emotions, to think and behave appropriately while feeling painful emotions, and to get back to joy from painful emotions. She must be able to be aware of and care for her own needs. She must learn to be aware and care for the needs of others. These are psychological spiritual skills that you learn during the process of psychological spiritual development. 
skills that you learn as you grow in maturity. Mastering these skills is an important part of maturing psychologically and spiritually. And this and here's, the, here's one of the kickers. This cannot be done alone. We are profoundly relational beings. We, we do not grow alone. It's not information plus will that makes me grow up. If I were a computer, that would work. As a person, it never does. I grow in relationship. I mean, you, you can't but read the, read the New, New Testament and not come to that conclusion. I mean, we're part of a body. We desperately need one another. Maturity is not a solo accomplishment. It's a relational and an interpersonal accomplishment. Preeminently with the Trinity. I mean, if there's no one, no other person around to help me grow, Emmanuel, God with us, is. And he happens to do all of the six painful emotions quite well. And he's really good about returning to joy and finding peace. I mean, he's actually got those down pretty well. So if there's no one else, we could learn to actually connect with him. But it's, can you get the, it's relational, it's not just information. I mean, I've known some people who had remarkable Bible knowledge. I mean, much of the New Testament memorized in Greek. But they didn't have the faintest idea of what it meant to love somebody. I mean, just, just there, was, there was just so little in their sense of self or in their memory of what that was like that they just were clueless. Uh, seen a lot of pastors, God bless them, who could give a nice message on marriage, but really didn't have a clue how to love their wives. Because it's too very, knowing the information and having the psychological, spiritual, relational maturity to do it are two very different things.